Very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Oh, I'm sure you'll wake up a little bit as the session goes on. We're drawing, getting a bit closer now, but uh, we still have, have still have quite a good present. Uh, sorry, quite a great session here in front of you before we go on to the gala dinner. So, to your while, sorry, there's a bit of mic feedback here. Um, it's been a fantastic day. Uh, we've, you know, in, in just three sessions and, uh, and, and, and the roundtable discussions, we've really, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, but I think this session now is, is a great opportunity to, to look to the future a little bit more. There is optimism, there is uncertainty, there's a lot of change. Uh, but, but I think there's, uh, and there's a lot that we in the room here can, can come together on to, to resolve and solve. Just a few housekeeping notes before we move on. First of all, again, I'm not, I'm not actually trying to steal it. This was actually found. Uh, so if anybody has lost this, this lovely little bracelet, I mean, it does suit me pretty well, I think. <laughs> so I'm happy to keep it if, if not. I'm just I'll keep, I'm keeping it for safekeeping. <laughs> but if it's yours, come claim it, please, and we'll get back to you. Um, as mentioned, you'll get the presentations in the next couple of days after the uh, event for those presentations which can be shared. Not everyone can potentially share, but most of the presentations will be available. And you'll also get links to photos and, 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 and our reports, which our editorial team is, is writing. Um, and so we'll have more information to share on that. At the end of this session, around 5.20, 5.30, when we wrap up, we will have coaches, uh, some buses leaving from the main lobby of the hotel, uh, going to Vicolo Nostro, for the Penske, uh, Penske hosted gala dinner. Uh, please join us on the coaches if you, if, if you prefer or if you're traveling there separately and you need, a, need directions whatsoever, please talk to us. I think we'll, we'll be able to help you at the reg desk. Talk to me, we'll, we'll give you the address and such as is necessary. Uh, it'll be a great evening. It always is for those of you who've been, uh, been there before. So, so please join us for that. And um, I, I mentioned this before for those there are it's my Jimi Hendrix mumble thing. Uh, <laughs> um, there, there are feedback forms on the table in front of you, so please, before you leave today, at some point, and, and we'll collect them or give it to any member of our staff. Um, it, this feedback is really important uh, as we look ahead uh, to what, how we want to interact with, uh, with you. As, as I mentioned in the last session, we're not just about a conference, although it's ostensibly a conference that we've done once per year. Uh, we have special reports. If you've been on the website today or saw on the app, we have a, a new report on, on Brazil, which we've just published. Uh, we run webinars. We have many, many other kinds of, kinds of content and, and services, and um, we're very keen to engage with, with you all uh, beyond the conference. So every other day of the year that we can be on LinkedIn, uh, via it in groups, via it in arranging meetings and such. So please do engage with us in that. Um, okay, so we, we had this as also one of our think tank sessions, which, uh, which, which we had a sum, summary of before, looking at logistics talent uh, to lead today and tomorrow. Uh, as you know, probably most of you know, we, we run conferences, we, we, we publish uh, magazines, our websites cover, cover global markets, so uh, whether that's Mexico, China, US, Europe. Um, so we have a, a perspective uh, that's fortunate, actually, and quite relevant, I think, to this industry. And, and one of them is definitely we see a trend across the world, and this is how do we deal with changing talent? How do we, how do we prepare our workforces for the future? How do we recruit the best talent? How do we engage with universities and, 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 and get students prepared for, for what the future supply chain and the current supply chain requires? And one of the interesting things as well which we've observed is although, of course, maybe in the room we're talking about, I don't know, IT systems and software and different, different kind of technologies we, we can use and prepare people for. But um, often in, in, in each of these markets, the need is just as much on the shop floor it's just as much for the truck drivers, something Brazil has definitely had its own troubles and challenges with, especially this year as well. It's warehouse workers. It's, 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 it's skills and labor across the supply chain um, at every level. Uh, there's shortages. This is changing. And as more automation comes in, as more technology comes in, if you don't have the support, the buy-in, the understanding, and the input of your, of your workers on the shop floor or on the, or the logistics 
um, professionals in warehouses and uh, in, in trucks, et cetera, um, then, those system, then those, that technology is unlikely to be as effective as it can be. So I think it's important that we address those issues kind of at every level. And that's something that, that we're focusing a lot on and, and we'd like to raise to the fore as well in our discussions here. So we'll have a, a presentation from, from Fabio, Fabio Garcia uh, from Volkswagen Truck and, Truck and Bus who will kick us off thinking about uh, the sorts of talent and skill that we need to be addressing for the future. And then Fabio will join us on the panel and we'll have an open Q&A, sort of wide-ranging discussion um, with some of the key logistics and supply chain decision makers here in South America, but, but of course, we're also engaging with you, um, who are other, of course, key tier suppliers, logistics providers, IT providers, outbound logistics providers. So please, be ready to join the, present the, join the discussion. We're very pleased to have Reinaldo Lanza, the director of, um, director of supply chain for General Motors here in Brazil. Joining us as well for the first time on stage, uh, Marcelo Piva, director of MPNL for South America for Ford. And most of you will have already uh, heard from Celso uh, Simomora earlier today, but for those of you who haven't, Celso is vice president purchasing R&D government and government affairs and PR for Toyota uh, Brazil, and has quite a lot of experience and background in specifically in logistics as well. So I think we've got a great perspective here and a great opportunity. So. Be ready to engage, ask questions, but before we open up the floor, Fabio, the podium is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to speak to you about the talents for the logistics of the future. For us, for our future here in Brazil, it's a different challenge from co when compared to other parts of the world. In 2009, we were worried about the fast acceleration in Brazil, that there could be a backlog in logistics. In 2010, we were the only part in the world where there was no crisis, and we wondered what we would do to grow and continue to sell. In 2016, we said we cannot fail to learn from the lessons coming from the crisis. And now, this morning, we have a different perspective from logistics. So this different point of view will probably reflect on how we forecast the future and lead our teams. Today, how do we define the success of a logistics professional? If the person is delivering the agreed to service level at the lowest uh, cost, there are drivers the person must work with, transport, warehousing, data processing, order processing, packaging, Looking, working with these drivers, reaching the level, service level at the lowest uh, Logistics cost, I am doing my job well, and it would be a success formula. However, this is no longer enough. Having the skills to reach the service level at the lowest total logistics cost is not what we'll need in the future. There is a matrix of uh, behaviors and competences that's changing. But one of them is a behavior that I see repeating itself in several areas and feuds, and I would like to share with you. There has been an overlap of speeches. The same thing is happening many places at the same time. I'm not an expert. In any of these feuds, I just wanted to share something different that I see happening. Everyone knows uh, Jack Welsh. I've heard of him talking about something different, the generosity gene. What is the role of a leader? The leader has to have the gene of a generosity. That sounded different to me. He 
the curly game that the leader has to clean the way for the lad person to attain the goal and enjoy the people's success. Oftentimes, the people you lead will be more successful than you, and you must be happy about that. Also, interesting is that he said that we are responsible for our people's lives. We are responsible for those we lead and for the decisions we make in the company that will reflect on the environment and the people we lead. So this is the first thing I found interesting. Another aspect that I found interesting are the thoughts by Haj Sisoja. I don't know if you have heard about this man from India. He's talking about the Shakti leadership. Have you ever heard about that? According to Hindu culture, there are individuals formed by Shakti leaderships, which is the feminine one and the masculine energy, yin and yang, that would be similar to that. And we must balance the masculine and feminine energies as leaders. And all companies have reached the level we are today, always working with the masculine energy. And there is now the time has come to have a feminine energy inside the companies. And that won't be achieved by bringing more women to the companies, but rather by bringing the feminine attitudes in balance with the man's or masculine attitudes that will bring harmony to the company. He says business needs to be based on love and care as well as focus and strategy. There are many women who are much more, uh, have much more masculine energies than feminine energies and that won't bring the balance we need today. And he says that we are birds that we cannot fly because we have a wing tied. We must untie this wing to be whole and fly. This is one point of view. And then come, comes the millennials. That's an idea adopted uh, 20, 30, um, the people who are 30, 20, 30 years old who will be most of the people we lead in coming years. They will work if their personal purpose is aligned with the company's purpose. Stefano talked about that in the beginning. And they, one of their top priorities is for the company to contribute to the community. That will lead them to work more or less. And when we talk about purpose, there's another idea, which is the conscious capitalism, which is based on four pillars, purpose, stakeholders, leadership, and culture, which shows us that everyone has a purpose in life or should have, whether small or big, and that should be aligned with the company. Companies can help people fulfill their purpose. And the more aligned the people are with the company's purpose, the more energy they would use to make that work. And this purpose must be aligned with stakeholders. We usually talk about shareholders, but stakeholders are all the employees, suppliers, environment, everyone that is related to the company that the company influences. And it also shows an interesting concept, win, 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 three times. Usually we see win, win. So it must be good for both parties as well as for everyone, for all stakeholders. And leadership must understand this concept and buy into it 
to make the company work well. It must, uh, the leader should provide opportunities for people to fulfill their purpose. So the leaders must pave the way or clean the way so leaders, so people who are led can fulfill their purpose in life. And also, culture is an important point because culture shows the company's values. For millennials and people who work in a more conscious capitalist company, culture plays a very strong role. People won't be able to work for a company whose culture is not truthful or who doesn't practice what they preach. So the culture is based on some pillars, transparency, accountability, caring, caring, integrity, loyalty, and egalitarianism. And this is a capitalism that creates value for everyone, not only for companies. So in this idea of uh, conscious capitalism, there are companies that are looking for certification. Have you ever heard of B Corp cer certification? It's a certification for conscious companies. And it follows these principles. The business must be good for everyone. The, co the company must generate benefits for stakeholders as well as for shareholders. The business of the company should not cause any problems to people. Must sh so this uh, offsetting rule does not work, uh, such as doing something wrong here and then building a school to make up for it. No, it must be good for everyone. And they understand that everyone depends on everyone else. So they must uh, be careful about what is going to happen for future generations. There are several companies with this certification. 2,600 companies, 150 industries in 60 countries. Natura is a most well-known company that has this certification and also a transportation company with a B Corp certificate in Brazil. This is something new, different in the radar. And I recently saw a study conducted by the automotive business with the, uh, on the topic of purpose. Automotive companies did a survey with the and found out that leaders lack purpose. Only 6% are clear about the purpose of the organization. So this is a yellow flag here for what can happen in the future. What is the trend of people in the led people to be, to have the synteny with the company? A philosophy. If this is good and true, there should be things uh, from everyday life in addition to work that would justify this type of uh, topic and idea. San Francis uh, was birthday was celebrated, so f for it is in giving that we receive. So I found several quotes. Uh, you can give 10% of your brain capacity. In terms of philosophy theories, the principle of correspondence, the principle of cause and effect, principle of gender, that prove all these things that are new in the business world. So to wrap up, the last time I was here, I showed this quote by an MIT director saying, what is supply chain? It is the science 
an art of getting products from where they they're made to where the consumer wants them to be made so with all these things that I see in terms of new trends we need to do this and the leaders must make decisions that will be beneficial for everyone not only for companies it's the win-win-win vision if it's good for one must be good for everyone otherwise it's not good so late Lately, I, these are the different things I've uh, noticed uh, popping up, and uh, I thank you for the opportunity to show to share this with you. That's it. Thank you. I think that a great start. I mean, a philosophical start, but, but very, very relevant, I think, to, to the issues that the industry are facing right now. In a way, I'm not so surprised at that 6% statistic when you think about an industry which is, you know, calling itself in the, in the process of transitioning to being mobility providers, a mobility service, but has traditionally been a provider of personal transport or other, or other kind of main definitions. So within people's short and long careers, we're seeing uh, changes in, in definition of what we're about. And, and so it's very interesting to reflect on that from both the automotive and the supply chain side. And so maybe I will just kick start off with that question, actually, as a philosophical one. In automotive supply chain management, do we know our purpose? Uh, are organizations aligned? Do you think that that is, that that is something which, which across your teams is, is something that needs to be better defined? So. We, we'll come back to you, Fabio, but, but maybe we'll, we can start with you, Celso, for Toyota. Well, uh, good afternoon to all of you. The ones with whom we have not spoken in the morning, it's a great pleasure to be here once again, speaking with our personnel that are here, our partners too, of the automotive industry. I would like to speak in a different way. When we speak about changes in skills and talents, uh, we could speak a little bit too about the story of our own company, the moment that we're going through. We already spoke in the morning about that, but this is very related with people in the way in which people should change well, the type of talents that we should develop for the future. We spoke that Toyota has already decided what uh, is going to be done. Uh, we get into um, the mobility aspect. And so we have the classical example. In the past, you saw the major companies like Motorola and Nokia that manufactured the cell phones, and they disappeared. Why did they disappear? Because nobody gets money manufacturing the cell phones. Now, it's using the mobile phone, and I believe that this is the future, too. In the future, nobody is going to obtain money manufacturing cars, but using the cars the car sharing in different ways of uh, doing mobility. And this is, is a major change. Our president is personally involved in that, and only him could do this uh, huge change uh, in our company. So he carries the name Coyota, third generation, and he could do the transformation. And he is challenging us constantly on leadership, how to change things. I don't know, but part of it, Toyota is an official uh, sponsor of the Tokyo uh, Games of 2020. So it's not just a campaign on the Olympic Games, but it's a change for the culture of our own company and the uh, aspects of uh, our uh, people, our employees. Toyota is a Japanese company, it's very traditional. 
so it's difficult. It seems easy to do that, but it's not at all. Before taking a decision, you know, uh, it's uh, you know our uh, uh, you vote and it's uh, very complicated. Let us uh, uh, change things. Go faster. Let's change things. I challenge you. You may make a mistake, but try something new. Well, it told us that the first time we could make a mistake, the second mistake, I don't know. But even so, it's something different for us. Mainly for us, it's different. I believe this is what we're talking about here. We are in a moment that he tells us that happens in uh, once every 100 years. We are within the process of vision. We do not know what is going to occur in the future, but we do think that things will change and that we have to run the risk and that we have to take decisions that will become more and more, more difficult and in a faster fashion. And that's the main challenge to the professional from on onwards, pro from now onwards. We have to uh, go faster, decide more quickly, and within all that, even within Toyota, at the very end of all that, we are based on the Toyota way. For your, for us, we have two main pillars in Toyota way: the continuous improvement and the respect to people. Every time we debate things, we go back to basis, to those two principles. So we have to change the profile of people and we are trying to become more aggressive in the good sense of the word to try to do new things this is a point that uh, has to change for the future and now speaking a little bit about this introduction with a um, vision a little bit different from what fabio presented to us good afternoon i would like to thank Automotive Logistics for my presence here. What about uh, the supply chain and the transportation of automobile parts for the future? I uh, don't see too many uh, differences. Uh, uh, it's going from point A to point B, transporting po parts well, the vehicles, only if it is an autonomous vehicle, but the parts cannot go to other point all alone. And we have to prepare people for things that we do not know about. What's the system we're going to use? In which way we're going to do that? Within the O&Ms, we have a very rooted philosophy of making things difficult in terms of uh, changes. We have to change the heart of the people, the mindset. We have to uh, take risks and accept errors. We have to work with less data. We're not sure if we're correct in the direction we're taking, and many times we shall uh, commit mistakes, make errors. In our work group, we have to accept that. Trust on, in us. The first time we commit a mistake, okay. Second time, nobody knows. But in all companies, we see what is occurring. This is the movement going in the same cultural way. Maybe the generation that is working today is difficult to change. The children of today, their chip will be uh, formatted from the birth differently from ours. But uh, you see the difference of our culture to the culture of our children. They have to do things differently and accept things differently. And uh, we have to change to be prepared for all that and prepare all the others that are working with us to accept those changes for the future. Be because we don't know where we're going to. This is a very important point is the, the preparation and training of people. Good afternoon. We from GM, uh, 
when I was invited to come here, talking to our people, what was our concern and our vision of supply chain and logistics? The concern that we have seen in the last year and a half. <coughs> expertise, We saw that the, we had lack of expertise within GEM and also in our suppliers. No talents. People that know the whole chain, order fulfillment, material flow, the whole supply chain within the GEM. We losing talents. A professional of supply chain is the person that daily deals with crisis, that has to understand the business, that has to be fast in a thinking process. And there's a person that is well trained for it, different areas. I lost people for manufacturing, finance, uh, sales, and purchasing. We lose internally at GM and also externally. Now, the economy starts uh, to develop and uh, we having problems with tier one. We thought, well, this is a um, financial problem or is it a capacity problem? When we started working with our suppliers, many from Brazil itself, we saw that 40 to 50% of the problems that have an impact in our supply chain is the mismanagement on our suppliers. Basic actions, things that are common, for instance, they do not have a clear stock policy. They do not have an understanding of risk management in the supply chain. The control is focused in just manufacturing. So this uh, started a, a red alert. We are lacking professionals of, for the area to develop a professional supply chain. It doesn't take uh, half a year or a whole year. In order for the person to understand a little bit of business, a little bit of uh, logistics and each or the sector, a uh, year and a half to two years. So this is the great challenge that we have. We have to retain the talent and uh, to develop other talents as soon as possible and work together with our supply chain. This is tier one. When you go to tier two, then it becomes even more difficult. Well, let me go back uh, a step. We see failures in uh, the training of professionals, in f the forming of the professional basic mathematics, interpretation of texts. They don't understand what they read, for instance. So we have a problem at the base and uh, the consequence will be seen in the professionals of today. I have another hobby. I love to give classes. And one of the things that I'm stopping and not doing any longer is to ask the person to read in public because the person tries to read aloud and is in, incapable of doing that. Uh, equation, first degree, uh, you know, they do not know what they're talking about. So is an uh, educational problem, basic education. And this is going to have as a consequence the impossibility of having good professionals as a consequence of that. I don't know what to do, but uh, we have to establish new actions on that. On the other side, the cultural aspect of the companies, I don't know if you are aware of that, Volkswagen created a new group called Traden. Uh, uh, Scania and Aman and Rio. And the first work they carry out they define strategies and uh, the objective, the goal for the company, and said uh, they wanted a new concept for the new company trading because uh, they want uh, to define clearly the, the purpose of the company so that the employees understand what they are about there. So the culture for new generation, the purpose is basic.
we already have difficulty in working in the company where we do not believe in in uh, the purpose of that uh, company the new next generation won't go there uh, new people if they don't buy the idea they do not work for the company we have to pay attention on that and we cannot lie culture purpose you know we cannot uh, mislead people immediately people see through the holes insightful points. A lot of um, focus there on the degree of being able to make mistakes and being able to, to fail as well, which is important. I should thank my company for letting, allowing me to fail a little bit every day. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps the biggest mistake they've made ever, giving me a microphone, for example. But um, <laughs> no, I, I, I thought um, Rinaldo talked some about some specific issues in the supply chain on the tier ones and some, some issues. If you were to assess where you're seeing some of the um, potential shortfalls or areas of improvement? What, what would perhaps come up as most acute right now or as, as a, the biggest problem right now uh, in the short term? M maybe the long-term perspective is a little bit different, but in the short term, if you're looking at Brazil and South America, where do, where do we need to address talent, skills, shortages in, in people uh, now? Maybe Marcelo, sorry. Well, following the line established by Fabio, we have a gap of basic knowledge, a gap in education. In South America, it's not only Brazil that we have this gap. And this uh, knowledge has uh, good roots in other countries, China, India, in terms of mathematics and systems. They're good at that. We debated the issue during the morning. We have to develop more uh, the skills of people for development of part of a system, not uh, to start at the basic programming for that, but but uh, people should be able to automatize uh, the activities, mainly the repetitive actions, so as to establish a system. Instead of repeating activities, give that to a robot, to a system to carry out, and every day work more as an analyst of a process. And this is going to impart the decision-making capacity of uh, you know, making mistakes or not, of uh, risk a little bit more to go forward. It's not an ability that is easily found in the market, mainly at the base that we have in the companies. And you have to develop this type of uh, capability in order to survive in the future. It's more analytical purpose than the repetitive uh, actions that we are carrying out today. In the last years, the ideal world of supply chain change. We had a frozen uh, forecast uh, for two or three months. This is dream, doesn't exist. The trend, the trend is following. We have to have automatized process to give support to fast uh, decision. This is our survival. Our client more and more wants to be free. Our final customer Well, we don't suffer that much because a more conservative type of uh, uh, the problem. But you know, in other in other sectors, you know, uh, the person wants to buy whatever they want and have it immediately wherever they want to have it. You know, uh, they want total flexibility. We don't have this flexibility. And this is going to ha have an impact in our industry sooner or later. Well, the plants need uh, the parts at the right moment, and the client wants his car the moment he wants. And he, he doesn't care the difficulty that we have to face in order to deliver the car to him. What's important for him is to have the final product in good quality with all the requirements that he believes that are needed. Well, not always this is well aligned. Should I change the logic here? 
put another aspect that is very interesting. And we see in our companies, last month, for instance, we started the first pilot for car sharing. The check of the system. On the pilot program, we um, st uh, started with a startup. Uh, and we had the board of directors uh, of our company and of the startup. We are the, we were the dinosaurs, and they were very young, 23 at the most, uh, and that was very shocking. So we have to start working with changes. The person that we chose to deal with this is a person from logistics. We are speaking about uh, mobility and it has a very interesting vision on the chain, uh, the relationships within the chain, uh, how people use logistics. So we have here an opportunity, you and, you and us, professionals in logistics, we have a major opportunity open to us. We know the process, so we could uh, go out of the box. And we need those people with us now. This is what we are requiring. So, in this group here, we have people that will become major CEOs of the huge mobility companies for the future. We believe in that. But what I would like to tell you is the following. The logistics professional, I believe that he is, well, speaking just about logistics here, but from here on, is there is an opportunity for the person to work with this projects in mobility is much more than other professionals. It's a huge opportunity that is open to us with the use of those new guys that understand logistics but think differently. Maybe they're going to give us good ideas for mobility. I want to speak about logistics, but differently. I believe that we should challenge people that work in logistics at the moment. You know, we have a major uh, future open to us when we speak about mobility. Logistics is the basic basis for all of that. We have great possibility of growing and opening new opportunities for the market. Well, transportation by trucks. This is an area that is working very strong in terms of uh, the electric support for trucks. And you have uh, the convoys of trucks, one after the other. The whole part of technology of systems. There is a new company that was formed called Rio. It's a new platform for the other companies to develop softwares to place within the trucks. So uh, the trucks are manufactured with the hardware and you can use all the apps to manage the truck or to do anything else that you decide to have. Uh, to check the driver of the fleet. The, the hardware is going to be used by any brand of uh, trucks. The new paradigm that is opening up a traditional truck company that at the same time has, together with that, a technology company. Well, the concept of transportation could be changed as well. We have the e-pallet. E-pallet is a transportation system, totally flexible, but it's not a car. Toyota bought a company from Uber in Asia and establishing some joint ventures with Amazon and uh, the Domino Pizza from the United States. What's the nice thing about that? So you say, I want a pizza. So it goes to the software and ask for a pizza. And the e-pallet comes to you 
making the pizza. So when the truck arrives, uh, the, the pizza is ready. And why Amazon? I want a tennis, but I do not know my number. So the car comes with all the models. You go inside the, the car, test the tennis you want, and use it. So a different type of transportation, a different thing for the future. We have to think about those new possibilities. That's where we see the changes, the changes that will occur quite fast. It's not a revolution, it's an evolution, but we have to be prepared to face that. In 10 years or five years, you know, we go very fast. Yeah, do you want to be a pioneer or a follower? To be a pioneer, there is a risk. Well, all the O&Ms, not only O&Ms and all the companies, the American ones, they are getting inside mobility. They get in, they get out, but they are trying to get in, really, in the business of mobility. And all the O&Ms, Ford also has all the technology startups sharing and other ideas, local ideas in the United States and others. Everybody trying to develop that. At this moment, what I think is more difficult is that we do not have a fixed uh, goal for us. Uh, what is the target? We have to test, we have to check different targets in front of us up to the moment that we are almost certain of the real uh, place to go. We do not know what are the skills that will be required from people as relates to the change for the future. Uh, things are not very precise at the moment. So, this part of electronics, the part of mobility is going to change very much. The focus, 30 to 40 percent of GEM will be in this field. Uh, GEM wants to be a pioneer. I went to Detroit several times last year. Uh, they created a whole division. They picked up uh, people from different businesses. Uh, legal, engineering, so the experts of different uh, colleges. Very interesting because we want to, to be pioneers in a new business. There will be changes and very fast. Right, we know that, but this is something that um, first you have to have a strategy. You cannot wait for your competition to see what they're doing. The focus of the new mobility, the urban area, will change. You know, the transformation will be huge for the next five years, and we cannot uh, remain put. Mm, those who don't have it won't maybe won't survive. Mobility that leads to the transportation of product that won't move around things. Uh, Maybe if you've heard of FedEx has 300, 300 3D printers testing. It's a project for the future. If they can get the expertise in each country. So the transport will be not to transport. They will make products locally. There are things that the local scenario for the future is different. And the, the, the statistic that you gave, Fabio, 6% uh, don't know the, the purpose. We can't decide if we're delivering pizzas or if we're, uh, if we're uh, <laughs> making cars in the future. Um, and and uh, perhaps we should be delivering um, Havaianas, actually, to bring it all for, <laughs> full circle, actually. But um, I think, I think, I think it's, it's, it's important. You all make a very important point about, about being uh, ready to go with these changes and to see the role logistics has in them, because the... Um, the product itself is becoming, and our societies are revolving around new concepts of logistics, whether it's in e-commerce or drones, 3D printing, and all, all these areas which we have fundamental, um, uh, we're on the front line in logistics with these things. But do you think this confused future, let's say, this multi-path future, is it making it more difficult 
to bring talent into your organizations now, or is it actually the opposite? Is it actually exciting people in, log in logistics and supply chain? Because again, the day-to-day -day job isn't yet always uh, these interesting concepts. The day-to-day -day job is to still keep the plant from shutting down um, and, and, and to build uh, the profitable products which still drive the industry. GM and Ford being the perfect example of we all know where most of the profit still comes from. It's still in the pickup trucks and bigger cars, not yet in electromobility or, or other areas. So is it, is it um, encouraging for the, the next generation or, or discouraging? What's your perspective? Well, let me talk about our company. We noticed that this new generation, let's start it. I started my career in manufacturing engineering. We noticed that when we interview some interns, when we see the potential of working in a supply chain or logistic, the entire potential challenge, there is a lot of transformation of technology in supply chain to attract talents, let's say, for an engineer either to work in product engineer, manufacturing engineer. Today, young people are much more connected with technology. They have lots of energy and logistics and supply chain are an excellent place to start. It's easier to attract talents to our area today. But there's a challenge, because nobody has ever dreamt about uh, working in supply chain. People dream about being doctors and physicians, you know, lawyers, I don't know. But working in supply chain is uh, getting to learn it about it and liking it. We need to show this to people, it's a challenge. And now, with technology, autonomous cars, electrification, that is uh, pending towards the area that uh, young people like, which is more technology driven. And this will bring what uh, this idea of uh, being cool to work in the automotive industry, you know, something that was true 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but got lost in, the, in this process. The largest customer of IT is logistics and supply chain. So when you talk about systems, the area that most attract talents is supply chain in IT. The load of IT, the load of information in supply chain is huge and it's very important. 50% of what we experience and what we do on a daily basis. I believe that for the future we will need more people with a vast uh, knowledge. I mean wide knowledge about most uh, areas, not only supply chain, rather than having more and more specialists dedicated to something only that spent their whole life doing something. For the future, w it would be important for people to have a, a more, a broader view. It's like uh, being able to step out of the box and analyzing the effect on the chain. It would be important for decision-making process. And I don't see major problems in terms of rejection to the supply chain career. I don't see that. It's quite challenging. It teaches us a lot. We learn a lot on a daily basis. There's always something new coming up. Uh, I don't see any rejection to that. like to get involved. Uh, again, we have microphones uh, in the room, so you just put up your hand and ask the panel anything. Obviously, it could be about the, the talent issue as we're discussing, but, but if there's other topics you'd like to raise as well, at any point, please just do, uh, just, just do, uh, just do ask us. Um, look, you're all part of large global organizations, obviously, and um, there are very specific challenges here in Brazil and South America. However, for logistics and supply chain, um, how do you scare, use the benefit of, of, of your global organizations to, to train and bring concepts and processes? Uh, is there 
is there cross training that, that you can do and draw upon um, across the region, um, and, and, and is this changing uh, as the technology changes in each in each region? Uh. Within Ford, we have global processes for almost everything we do on a daily basis. So I may say that 90 to 95 percent of training and everyday work of people is uh, treated and uh, trained globally. In some cases things are translated from English into sp or Spanish, but it's treated globally. And 5 percent of activities are done globally, for example, taxes. It's mandatory to have a specific training in the country. Each country will have a different uh, aspect about that. So y you either look at the market or develop courses internally that will allow you to best uh, teach people about laws to prevent any non-compliance with current laws. But most of the procedures are global. 95% is done uh, equally in all regions. Development is much easier. We attend, we take part in the development process, both of the tools as well as the courses. And, and there are some specific items that we contribute, but in and for at Ford, it's usually driven by the United States. Uh, for us, the systems are global. The, the difference is that due to our laws and infrastructure, it's more complex than in Europe or United States. So there are some specific skills that apply to Brazil. And also, due to the salary structure, you do not have the same support of the U.S. Sometimes you have the same person in Brazil that performs more activities than an American and have some more activities due to our complexity of our economy. But the processes are the same. We used to send more people to travel. Today everything is web-based. E-learning e -learning allows the knowledge to be spread out in our regions. The concepts are global, but in Brazil, the difficulties are so big. We mentioned in the morning session that it took us to work with just-in-time and low inventory levels. It's such a simple concept, but practicing it in Brazil without the difficulties we face is still a challenge, and quite a challenge. It took us almost 20 years to reach the global level of 10 ppms, 10 defects per parts per million. Even so, we reached it last year. But if we compare to the United States, we're doing better than the US, I'm sorry. Uh, and at the same level of the Europe, but Japan and Asia, they have two ppm levels. I mean, and delivery levels uh, in the morning session, we're talking 40 minutes. Milk run is five minutes tolerance. Uh, so there's so many challenges. Our line uh, downtime, we have inventory in the production line for four hours next to the line one hour. So what is what was our main reason for line uh, stopping the production last year power power failures you know this is the country we live in and we're talking about logistics of vehicles our country is continental so we work, because we work without inventory, the consumers don't have the car in the yard. So as they order the car, we are producing it. So there's a bridge that falls 
or we have to find out alternate routes, uh, you know, so many hurdles in the way. So I would say that the last global meetings in logistics, we always uh, stand out because uh, Brazilians have something very, Brazilians are so creative. I mean, it's not about getting around things, you know, it's Brazilians are really creative. So we showed in the morning the system that we developed to read the number of parts that was created in Brazil based on some ideas that were given by Europe, but it was created by our team here. And then all the plants in the world wanted to know how we developed that. And then Japan said, oh, you create this system, but you don't need to check because everything's supposed to come right and said, okay, that only works in Japan because in Brazil we still have to check what comes <laughs> to check if the right amount is coming from the suppliers. So the concepts are the same. But I'd say that the logistics professionals in Brazil are very creative and they face many challenges on a daily basis. So things work well in theory, but we know that here we have millions and millions of different challenges to face. And this is what makes it interesting. When we make presentations uh, in other countries, people first don't believe the problems we face, as well as the, the solutions we find that are so creative. So it's cool. I mean, our logistics professionals are quite admired in within the global organization. The concepts are the same, all right, but when it comes to making it happen in Brazil, that's tough. And what's important is never giving up. With Despite all the problems, we don't give up. When we started this project, people told me, you're crazy to try to do this. But after 20 years, we managed. It took us some time, though, but we succeeded and the many things are still improving we still have a lot to go uh, to do but we must acknowledge that we have improved a lot in brazil japanese counterparts the brazilians have more jobs to do for one person and more challenges to uh, to overcome with them although i would i would kind of make a contrast perhaps with india because they have some pretty interesting challenges with logistics as well you have to introduce sacred cows coming around into the into logistics as well. It's really, I think, it makes Brazil look a little easy by comparison. But I think, I do, <laughs> but I do, th I think that's uh, all great points there. And it, you know, when you and, and taking advantage of a global organization in this way to 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 take a global system but use the local speci specifics to improve it, I think that's fantastic. Um, any any comments, questions from from the audience? Any oh, question there? I thought maybe we'd, we'd, we'd have an American kind of trying to defend themselves a little bit, but. <laughs> so say your name and company, please. Olá, boa tarde. I'm Rafael Romano from Penske Logistics. More and more technology companies are merging and operations and technology, you still don't know how to separate them. And you mentioned many challenges for the future. And I would like to know from your company, how is the process of uh, development and actually teaching the simple concepts of these new technologies to leaders? And there are some new technologies that are coming up. And you say, talk about this technology for one hour. Few people are able to go so much in depth about the emerging technologies. So how are companies trying to develop the literacy of their employees in the new technologies? Well, within Ford, we identified this gap. We have a process in which we check what are the necessary competences for supply chain professionals. So we have this table for today and for 2025 to 2030. And we notice that some skills or competences would change. 
Let me give you an example. All the IT and programming skills we need to develop in people. As pi for our pilot project, we chose five people to start with that. They have, they are more talented for that, and we're training them to for boat programming. That is done in China and India. They've been through this training. There are several people working in logistics after these training sessions, and we brought this technique to Brazil and Argentina to try to develop our professionals regarding that. Another point that we are working with is big data. In the beginning, working with big data was based on an IT organization and now it's going to the base area training on the use of uh, softwares that allow us to work better with data, maybe creating charts or tables or graphics and benefit from such information. A major transformation we can see is how long it takes to obtain information Things that took us a week or two weeks to obtain in terms of crossing tables and systems today is done overnight by a robot because it's the task of each one followed. You don't wait for someone else to send you a table or answer your email. The robot does that overnight alone. And then we update us every week or depending on the area, that has rendered information much more agile. So now analysts have more time to do the analysis job. All the work they used to do to of getting tables together and compiling data is now dedicated to the analysis of the data. What is that data telling you? What is the direction it's pointing at? I'm going to divide this in two parts. For example, shop floor, um, WBS, uh, people who used to be forklift drivers, when we implemented the new WMS with new machines, they could you work with a scanner and a joystick. Uh, if you trust the system, there were several weekends and third shift to tra train them. We were afraid because almost 70% of them were very simple people, uneducated and 30% from the new generated. We did several simulators and what we were more af most afraid of was on the training. On the, uh, on the contrary, even older people uh, learned a lot and they trust. In the beginning, they didn't trust the system. Now, they now trust the handheld system. Several weekends, several hours of training, we got the support from GM US. As in the office, the revolution we did in the last year and a half, all the meetings, whether it's inventory, projects, uh, materials, the supervised, we do Power BI. You must have information based on history, data. So there's an entire big data. All the areas talk to each other. So today, decisions are made much quicker. Training, for example, not everybody had exam uh, advanced uh, skills on Excel. We did the uh, training sessions with all the first line uh, supervisors and managers. So 100% of our meetings are based on technical data and analysis. Good afternoon. My, I'm Evan de Silvestris from General Motors. My question is about purpose. This is very interesting because we are human beings and we want to have a purpose. But I would like to comment on this uh, other aspect of it. People are naturally maturing later, especially this newer generation. So, so they're becoming mature older. The sense of purpose, you all know, we've been old, I've been young, 
We have a purpose when we were young, and now as you mature, as you grow older, your purpose changes. So when we try to create purpose for these people at a certain point in their lives in which they're not as mature as they should be, what is the risk of making mistakes and creating things that are not real, I mean, or not uh, adapted to reality? Is there any line of thought or is you just think it's millennial, they're different, it must be different, and that's it. Or is this also analyzed? Okay, his millennial has different, but we must understand that this person is maturing. That's the question. <laughs> Você é o millennial, você pode responder. Uh, it's the GM question, so someone from GM must answer. Uh, I, uh, you better answer. <laughs> Well, purpose, in my point of view, can be small, big. It's not a single one for your whole life. It could be one, more than one life, uh, more than, or the purpose of buying a car or making a trip. The, the, the person's attitudes will vary according to the person's purpose. The most important the purpose, the heavier the weight it will have on the person's attitudes or conduct or based on this point of view it's not that the company gives a purpose to the person the purpose has his or her own purpose and he this person will look for a company that is aligned with this your person's own purpose and if it uh, works, then if it matches, then they would work. It's not that they will get the purpose of the company and follow it for life. This is my point of view. Um, as, we, as we see the changing in generations. Any, any qu other questions? We have a question right up here in the front. <laughs> This time we might actually hear from Millennial, I think. So. <laughs> Hola. Hello, my name is Carolina from Influence. I'm a manager of uh, Eaton Logistics Commodity Manager for Brazil and Latin America. In your presentation, you mentioned the Indian guru or Hindu guru. That would be interesting for corporations to find a balance between feminine and masculine characteristics not necessarily a division between men and women, but about the characteristics. I would like to understand in, in logistics how the feminine characteristics would stand out or could be applied. Not necessarily in the, in the basics of logistics or basic jobs, but also in management positions because we see that Man women who are managers currently have more masculine characteristics. So how the feminine uh, skills could be highlighted in logistics? Logistics is very feminine because it's, serv it's service. It's servicing the customer in the best way possible. It's caring. In the theory of this guru, it's a feminine energy. So for us, in order to take care of a customer, uh, this comes from the feminine power sign. I have to be careful when you talk about masculine and feminine. I'm talking about energies uh, that are named feminine or masculine, but uh, Shiva, it could be yin and yang. What's important is to have a balance, like everything in life. Balance is needed. And balance for the leader, that's not only about uh, fighting, destroying, pushing, running, but there are times in which you need to care for your team. Come, let's work together. I'll help you in this. Yes, that's the idea. Um, <laughs> B 
também. Maybe not quite 10 years when, when everything is potentially autonomous and, and digitalized. But what, what, are your, what are your top supply chain priorities now looking out over the next, say, one, two, three years? Uh, we're, we're, we're going back to, we're hopefully, on a path of recovery. Hopefully, there's reform that brings some change. We don't know. Obviously, there's plenty of uncertainty. But um, what would you sort of address to your suppliers, to your logistics providers, of setting the sort of vision now and sort of what you need for them to come with you uh, of your, your priorities now over, let's say, the one next one to three year horizon? And we'll start with Marcelo. <laughs> Bom, uh... Well, the first priority is the operational portion. You have to do what's the purpose of logistics. Second, one and two does, do not change. The same thing is the operational part. You have to deliver the part and the vehicle. And second point, you have to improve the cost structure, avoiding all the waste that we find in the chain due to the country, due to internal situations or a partnership. The third pillar, uh, to be prepared and go through transition, is to develop people. People are key, and they will become more and more so in the future process. So, if at any moment we put that aside, we're going to lose the first and the second point. They are totally dependent on the work of people. The three basic pillars for us to maintain the chain, the supply chain, working correctly for the future in a short period of time. This is what I see. Well, our focus. I'll mix uh, changes very fast, so we should have good information, fast information, and uh, to uh, go fast in our answer to the market needs. We have to have uh, talents, systems, and another point that uh, we are motivating our people to do is to research and study not only our segment, but we have our benchmark and our competitors, but they'll go to other activities and check things out. We are motivating people to go to uh, talks, meetings, conferences, uh, not only in our own sector, but just to help us to find ideas to adapt to our own business. In past sales, past sales are going to change too. Trucks. For instance, trucks will be electric engine. 3,000 items will decrease to 600 that will not wear, wear off. And the uh, truck is going to be autonomous. There will be no accidents. And we won't need to refurbish so much. So this is going to change our business because this is going to be the future with poor sales. Poor sales has to go to a service. Normally, we have much substitution of parts. In the future, we won't have that occurring. Now, speaking a little bit, on the short term for next year's. What are we asking our suppliers to do? We made the comment here already. We believe that we have a consumer base which is improving a lot in the last years. The quality, the delivery, the evolution was positive and it was huge in all our supply chain and suppliers. The problem now is competitiveness, how to deal with that, how to be able to be competitive still. So, I don't know what about this new government, but um, 
we were very close to close the deal with the European Union. But we think about the Australian case. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's the first, no, the second case that I see that Toyota closes a manufacturing plant. Because we had this process of opening and unfortunately people didn't become competitive up to a point when importing was better than producing. I believe that we're going to have the same process occurring here. Perhaps this is going to take a little bit longer or perhaps this is going to be faster because we have the new government taking office, but the process will occur. And if we're not prepared, it's not just a thing of having quality and delivery. And I'm not saying that it's not important. Of course it's important, but we have to become competitive, guys. There is no other way out. And we cannot be competitive due to protection. No, competitive because we really produce here in the best possible way, in an efficient way, improving our productiveness. This is the great challenge that we're going to face here onwards. In the morning, you spoke a little bit about uh, uh, the process of electrification. Yeah, this is going to come, but it's dependent on infrastructure. So it's not a revolution, it's an evolutionary process. We have to be prepared as much as possible for the new technologies. The last year, it's interesting because we sent in some buyers to Japan to learn how to negotiate softwares. How, you, how do you determine the price? A compatible price with the software. Different things that are occurring. We have exclusive team for uh, production preparation in Yaris. We had a specific unit, but we had some failures because uh, we did not know that we had to have a link with Google, for instance. And then I said, okay, guys, we have to understand things better. We're doing all the schedules and we are doing the best and, and then we're lacking on the other areas. We have to prepare, but very fast for the new demands how to negotiate with startups. We have a new project with the startup. What is the correct price? How do you determine the business? What's the value of the project? Many, many things that are new and that are occurring, and we have many challenges too. So, we did improve in in terms of quality and also in terms of safety. We work a lot in safety, environment. We don't require ISO 9000, but we require ISO 14000. Compliance is becoming very much important. But we have to work with competitiveness here onwards. We have to work with all the problems we have to face here. We know it perfectly well in our region. We have lots of problems. At the same time, we have to become competitive. Uh, this is the point. The second point is to be prepared for new technologies. When I speak about new ne technologies, is to train. And we, from purchases and supply chain, we have to know how to deal with the daily life problems. There is another very important thing that is quite clear. Integrity, compliance, integrity. You know, this, those are the new words. You cannot step out of uh, those two. This is basic prerequisite, mandatory. You have to follow this line of thought. And for the future, there is no longer the Brazilian 
way of escape accountability. No longer. This is what is going to be fair and uh, will be fair for everyone in the supply chain. Eu não gostaria de terminar com outro ponto. Então, vamos deixar isso como último comentário. Portanto, então, nessa última rodada, nós vimos aparecer alguns pontos muito importantes. Look at what's happening in, in places where, uh, with GM's recent announcements and how quickly things can change um, if we don't stay competitive. And obviously, I'm not, that's not a comment against the supply chain in the U.S. as such, but it just makes the point that um, there's no time to lose. And, and I think logistics and supply chain can and will and should play a big, big role in, in that competitive factor. And for companies, governments, suppliers, everyone to, to be aware of that. Uh, and the point about integrity and fairness um, and uh, transparency, um, from, again, right from the top levels of, of government, society, but certainly in our companies and in our processes from an operational, but also from a supplier management and relationship point of view. Um, and coming back to the, the, the front, the sort of title of, of, of this session, um, with engaging with, with employees, engaging with our organizations. Uh, I think that's part of what will give the purpose um, for, the, for the supply chain of the future. So I, I think that this, this was a fascinating discussion. I think it, it, we, we covered a lot, of, a lot of very interesting concepts, talked about different models for the future, um, but also uh, I think was grounded in things that we're, that we're doing day to day. So thank you. Thank you very much to the panel for, for the time. And thank you to all of you. So um, as, as we kind of close the formal part of the event and move on shortly to, to the, uh, cocktail, to the uh, gala dinner, I just wanted to uh, highlight again the, um, uh, the, 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 the feedback forms. Please don't forget to, to give them to us uh, when, you, when you pass it out. Join us shortly for the cocktail reception as well. I keep saying cocktail reception, but our, our reception this evening hosted by Penske. I want to thank again our, our sponsors. So again, Penske, our, our premier sponsor, who will host us this evening. Also, CFR Rinkins as our gold sponsor, and our global sponsors, CHEP, CNW, and uh, Jeffco. So, so, so thank you again to every all of our partners for that, and we look forward to the continuing the discussion. Uh, again, uh, hard to sum up everything now, just just in a couple of words. I won't, I won't, I won't try. I think, I think actually, in the end, the points around competitiveness, integrity, and purpose, in a way. Are, are quite defining to me, uh, defining for, for what I'm learning and about the, the direction that the supply chain in Brazil is and should be going. We talked about a new dawn. We've talked about the changes ahead. We talked about the uncertainty. Uh, I admire the optimism probably more than anything. Um, perhaps that's uh, one of the other Brazilian traits, which is, uh, which is quite to be admired. Uh, you know, the expression, which I'm sure you all know, Brazil is the country of the future, and it always will be. But um, I am optimistic uh, about what I've, what I've heard about the, the, the investments, about the talent, about the, um, the processes, about the, just the sense of purpose that, that we're hearing from our leaders today, and, and about where we're heading over the next couple of years. So we look forward as Automotive Logistics to continue to engage with you. As I mentioned before, um, we, we, we have reports that we're, that we're constantly writing, our editorial team, led by Joanne Perry, who's here in the front. Most of you met uh, or, or, or heard of in the last session. Uh, in session two, Marcus Williams, features editor, also here. If you have ideas to share, please come to us. You can talk to me, of course, as well. Louis Yakumi, who many of you use. Get in touch with us, because our purpose is to inform, inspire, educate, and connect uh, in the market here. And that's what we set out to do. And that's where we'll be looking to continue to do with this market um, over the next year and well beyond. For those of you with an international perspective, as I'm sure many of you have, we, uh, we also uh, invite you to engage with us elsewhere in the world. Again, the coverage that we do uh, in other regions uh, and also the conferences and events that we put on. Uh, perhaps the next one coming up in January may be of particular interest to some of you in Mexico, not least given the, uh, the, the, the challenges and the, the changes that they face there. There's some, obviously some similarities. Uh, and then obviously we have a, a schedule that runs through uh, many parts of the world. That's a few highlights in, in, in the US, uh, in both Atlanta and later in Detroit in the year, and also in California and Baltimore. Uh, we're in China and Shanghai. 
uh, we'll be in Munich for our, our Europe-wide conference. We have an event in Central Eastern Europe, which, which moves around. It was just in, in, in Hungary. We're looking at where we put it next year as well. And uh, every now and again, we, we, we go home to the UK where we live, and we actually have an, have an event there as well. So and any, anything that's interesting to any of you, again, talk to us. You're very welcome to join us there. We also have materials and insight that we can share from those markets. Um, but, uh, but, but for now, it only leaves me to invite you to join us uh, this evening to the, to the Penske-hosted uh, gala dinner. Again, we will uh, be leaving in the next 15 or so minutes uh, from buses which will leave from the lobby. So if you don't want to collect your, collect your things uh, and go, uh, it's, it's not, I mean, okay, Sao Paulo traffic aside, I know we can't, we can't predict it, but it's 10, 15 minutes away, so it's quite local. Um, please join us there. Any questions at all, get in touch. We'll be sending you links as well with presentations, as I mentioned, uh, over the course of the next coming days. So thank you to all of you again. Abrigado, and please join us this evening.